Okay, my name is Jim Hemscott, and uh, I worked at uh, RCA in Camden at Government Communication Systems. Um, started in 1972, um, and my first my first uh, program was the small terminal. Um, I had been a co-op during my uh, bachelor's at uh, University of Cincinnati, and I picked up a rather unique um, experience called ferro-resonant power supplies. Um, that's the only reason I got hired, by the way, at RCA. Didn't do terribly well in my interviews, um, but I had this one thing and they needed it. So they set me to work on the small terminal power supplies. The small it's a super high frequency satellite terminal. And uh, of course, without the power supplies, it doesn't work very well. So um, that was my first assignment. Um, as a young engineer, of course, I was set to work for um, a more experienced engineer. His name was Don. And it was kind of interesting because Don was very experienced. Um, didn't always like to listen, though. Um, one time I found a defect in our power supply where we were actually um, over dissipating a component, brought it to him, and Don would sit there with his pipe, and he'd say, no, I don't think so. And that was it. And I took that to uh, his supervisor, and he listened, and then he called in Don, and Don said, no, I don't think so. And that's where it basically died. So very early in the, my career, I learned that sometimes instead of butting your head against a wall, you need to go around a wall. And uh, so I sat down with him very humbly and asked him if he would please explain the circuit to me because I wasn't sure I understood it. And he started very patiently explaining the circuit to me. And he got to this one component and... Hmm. Guess there's a problem here. And so we went and fixed the problem. But um, tact is not something that I was noted for, but every once in a while it happened. So that was the small terminal um, program. That was my first one as a young engineer, first job out of college. Any other major projects you worked on? Oh, yes. Well, from the small terminal power supply, once we finish that, of course, the next thing you have to do is um, do what they call qualification testing, which was vibration and shock, cold soak, hot soak, where they would put the thing into an environmental chamber and take it down to minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. They'd put a parka on me, open the door, and say, okay, go go start her up now. Um, minus 32 is pretty darn cold. And I remember sitting in the small terminal uh, shelter trying to get it to run and actually taking and holding on to a light bulb just to try to get my hands warm enough. Um, the light bulb was a standard light bulb, but at that temperature, um, it was a low enough temperature that I could actually hold it and warm my hands and then start working on the equipment. Um, so the qual testing was fun. From uh, the small terminal, after we did the qual testing and the field testing, then I went on to the integrated radio room for the Trident submarine. 24 racks of communications equipment. This was the only um, room ever in the Navy where a sailor could sit at a console and totally configure everything. Configure the antennas, tune the radios, receive the messages, and every radio from what they called extremely low frequency ELF, which is similar to a big foot stomping on bedrock, um, all the way up through super high frequencies. Uh, the one thing the Trident needed to do was to stay in communication. Very important for the nuclear deterrent. 
So I worked on um, the IR squared, the integrated radio room. Um, I went in and there was a concept basically that said, do your software, do your hardware, put them together and deliver it. Well, that never works. Um, there's a thing called hardware software integration. And uh, that was not a term. That was a term that my team basically coined. And we basically took the position, uh, I don't care how much you've debugged your software. I don't care how thoroughly you've tested your hardware. When we put them together, I guarantee you it won't work the first time. And um, I developed a team, a hardware software integration team. Um, funny people. Uh, rather strange. We would work, oh my goodness, we would work. We would, we would show up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and by 10 o'clock at night, we'd decide to go home and get a few hours sleep and get back and do it again. And that was because the Trident was so important. Um, it got to a year behind schedule. The Navy was talking, <clears throat> excuse me, about canceling the program, and it was up to us to get this darn thing done. Um, so we did. Our job was to break the system, and we did it very well. Um, but we finally got the thing done. Um, I, uh, I remember one software engineer came over with a, uh, a change to his system and said, you don't have to test this. I've already thoroughly tested it, and it is ironclad. Well, that to us was just a challenge. Um, so I had one guy uh, working for me. His name was Roger. And Roger loved to break things. And I said, Roger, come over here. Roger comes over. And I said, this guy said that his software can't be broken. I said, I want you to do it. And Roger would get all giddy and his eyes would bug out. And he'd tear into the thing. Well, a half hour later... The thing was on its knees, and we called the guy back over, put up a big banner saying welcome back and things like that, but to demonstrate that you have to be able to do hardware software integration. And that's a discipline that, that we introduced to the RCA plant. Um, turned out to be rather successful, um, and the Navy backed off from wanting to cancel it, and we ended up uh, with a production line. Now, you have to understand, a production line of an entire radio room, they expect these things to turn out about once every nine months. Um, again, I challenged Roger. We, got into, we had two sites set up, and I challenged Roger to take the one and beat the other one. And, uh, God, we worked crazy hours. But anyway, that happened. We got our stuff delivered. It was put on, the first Trident submarine was the USS Ohio. Um, it was put on there. And it worked well, but I guarantee you it still had bugs in it. So um, we uh, got a call one day from the Chief of Naval Operations. The, uh, the Ohio uh, was, had been out on its first leg of performance and things had not gone well. And the chief of naval operations said, get a Tiger team out to the West Coast and fix it, period. Don't care how long it takes, how hard you have to work. And we did, we got our team out there, we found out what was wrong, we made the changes, and of course um, a fair amount of it was uh, bugs that were still in the system. Um, but we got it fixed. It was a very exciting time being out there with the operational Navy on a nuclear boat uh, with the Marines guarding the nuclear missiles. And uh, we went out on sea trials to prove that it was working. Um, it's a strange thing being on a large, silent submarine. You're standing there in the room, and all of a sudden your perspective shifts because the submarine has just gone into a turn. Uh, and that's all, that, that's all that you know, because of, obviously there are no windows in that thing. 
and um, they would do a thing um, called the emergency blow. Um, if a trident had to get to the surface, it would blow all its tanks, and it would shoot up like this and then settle back in. Um, very uh, interesting experience. But, you know, working with the Navy, it was an incredible experience. And we were all proud to be out there, all proud to do it. So that was probably my best program, the one that I enjoyed the most. Worked on it for 10 years. Um, very, very successful program in the end. It, would, it brought in, oh, we were doing $150 million a year um, in um, production and then uh, maintenance and, uh, and um, you know, instruction of the sailors and things like that. Good program. So you talked about working really hard. How was the social life outside of work? Well, I like to say we worked hard. But we played hard. Um, we, um, you know, when things let now, when it was time to work, it was it, we we worked. I mean, there was a time, a six month period there where we were up in Rhode Island at the land based evaluation facility, and there were things that needed to be fixed, and that Trident needed to make its schedule. Um, we would go into work before dawn, and we would leave work well after dark. And then we'd go back and do it again. We did that for six months. And as things let up, as we got everything under control and as everything eased up, I remember one day we knocked off at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I walked out that door and I was shocked because there was the sun, you know. Um, that was the working hard. But when things did ease up, and got down to a regular routine. We had a group, we'd sneak off at least once a week and go play golf. Um, we had our parties. <laughs> oh, did we have our parties. I worked in the, um, Hugh Montgomery ran the IR squared as a program manager. And if, if there was nothing else, Hugh knew how, knew how to party. Good program manager too. Um, so we would, um, we would play. We would uh, we would socialize. Um, I wasn't much with the uh, softball games and things like that, um, the golf leagues, but a lot of people were, okay? Um, but we just, uh, it was one of these things where life was just uh, continuity, and your coworkers were also your friends, and oh, the respect we had for each other was just incredible. We wouldn't tolerate the goof-offs. See, that's one thing. RCA didn't have to worry about it because the working people wouldn't tolerate them. And uh, they just got marginalized and ended up giving up and going somewhere else. Uh, so we had a really good crew left. Um, any other supervisors or coworkers that you have specific memories of? Oh, sure. Um, you know, I started under Ed Sigich and Bob Lawton, and they were good, solid people. Um, the integrated radio room, I mentioned uh, Hugh Montgomery, and um, ended up ultimately working for uh, Charlie Smith. Charlie uh, worked his way up from a technician up to executive vice president. You either loved Charlie or you hated Charlie. There was no in-between. Um, I was on the side that loved Charlie, and Charlie got me um, my break into management, where one day I just sent up a note, said, Charlie, you know, I've done this 10 years now. Um, I need something more. I need something to challenge me. So he called me and said, all right, well, we got this program called uh, Bullseye, um, it's in trouble. They're a year behind schedule. Here, it's yours. <laughs> so that was kind of a fun thing, but it, you know, it was his confidence. And the first thing I had to do was to break into the team because they didn't particularly like it that uh, a young upstart would come in and take over the program. But we got it straightened out, and um, we ended up getting our productivity up by a factor of three, and the customer was fairly impressed with that. 
Um, so, you know, it, it, it became a successful program, but it was, a, it was a difficult thing. So Charlie was, uh, was a supervisor that I had a lot of respect for. So how would you say that uh, RCA impacted South Jersey as a whole? Well, it was really hard to find somebody who didn't know somebody that was working at RCA. And it was, you know, fathers, grandfathers, sons, daughters, wives, um, all working together. And uh, neighbors, you know. Um, in South Jersey, just about everybody worked for RCA, it seemed. Now, that wasn't really true. But I do believe RCA planted that seed, all right? I have heard a, um, a statistic that says even today there's a greater density of engineers in South Jersey than anywhere else in the world. Um, that's a huge impact on, um, you know, on a region. Um, so, and you, you were with RCA, obviously, for quite a bit of time. So mm -hmm. how were you personally affected when GE and RCA merged? Yeah. Um, the RCA family was something that um, you have to really experience, to, experience it to understand it. Um, we looked out for each other. We took care of each other. We cared about each other. Um, and RCA cared about us, and we felt like that. Um, and um, then one day we heard that GE was buying RCA. So, all right, fine. Jack Welsh, very, very smart guy. Great businessman. Um, and then GE started dumping in what they called their high pots, high potential individuals. Young people who were selected for a management program but had very little experience, especially with customers. Um, oh my goodness, the, the change. Um, we uh, basically were nudged out of the integrated radio room support programs because um, the GE management started simply maximizing their profit even at the expense of a customer. Wherever they had something sole source, oh, they were ruthless as far as the bids went. And I remember receiving a phone call once from uh, a guy fairly high up in the uh, um, SPA war, which was the Navy uh, development organization. And he called me up. He said, Jim, he said, what's happening? He said, you guys are our sole source. He said, but the way you're treating us, we're going to train another company to take over, and you're going to lose your business. Um, that wasn't really terribly important to the high pots because they were there for a period of a maximum of 90 days, and they wanted their performance maximized for that period <clears throat> of 90 days. <clears throat> well, RCA was one of these companies that uh, talked in terms of 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so that was really, um, really a shock. Uh, I had a tremendous respect for Jack Welsh. Very, very smart guy. His policies, incredibly smart. Um, his ability to, just to select management people. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I guess you just can't do everything. But it was, it was a real serious shock. The frustration that GE had was they were never quite able to uproot the RCA family. And I went through all five transitions. GE uh, sold us to Martin Marietta. Um, <clears throat> Martin Marietta merged with... Uh, with Lockheed to form Lockheed Martin. Um, and Lockheed spun us off to L3 communications. And we went through different, you know, from GE, it was I'm not sure, people are commodities, maximize your profits. With Martin Marietta, Norm Augenstein, um, he stopped everything GE started as far as getting rid of the experienced people who were higher paid. 
And he said, you will not retire my most valuable people early. These are, so, you know, it, it felt kind of sort of almost like coming back to RCA. Um, merging with Lockheed, we ended up with this huge, huge conglomerate that was um, centralized down in Bethesda, Maryland. And I remember going down to, uh, to visit or make presentations there. And this long hallway with vice president after vice president after vice president, each one with a secretary outside the door. Uh, you know, it was a huge conglomerate. And then um, we finally got spun off to L3 under Frank Lanza. And Frank Lanza was another one of these geniuses that cared about his people, but he also cared about the technology. And it was almost like coming home again, but nothing quite matched the RCA family. And how did it feel to retire from RCA? That was a hard one. Um, I mentioned I took over as director of the classified programs. I can't tell you a lot about them, but I can tell you that the security profile of the country was hugely improved by the work they were doing. The effectiveness of the work that we did behind closed doors was that people thought it was impossible. Um, the chief engineer used to complain to me that we had an inordinate, inordinate amount of the best engineers in Camden. And I said, I have absolutely no apologies for that. Our work is so important. Um, so this group was one, we were behind closed doors. My people worked without windows. They worked under intense scrutiny. Um, if you were going to be more than two hours late to work, you had to phone in. And yet they stayed. And they stayed because the work was so exciting and so incredibly important. Um, so, you know, me retiring, great, we had a good pension, you know, I had savings, uh, you know, why not? But letting go of my people and turning them over, thank goodness I was able to manipulate it where I turned it over to someone I really trusted, Dave Micah, who, by the way, is now running L3. Um, and that's the only reason that I could even feel comfortable about retiring was that my people would be taken care of. Okay. And overall, can you just, was RCA just a job for you? Or <laughs> was it, obviously it was fun. RCA, RCA was a life. RCA um, was so much more than a job. Yeah, they paid me, you know? And they paid me reasonably well. You know, it, it was fair payment. I, I remember being told a couple of times by some consultants and some uh, customer types that I was really underpaid. Um, but it was fair. And I felt it was fair. And the atmosphere was right. I mean, RCA, I stayed there the whole 37 years. Um, and yeah, I felt that um, it's so integrated into your life that it's really hard to imagine. Um, you know, I, I've heard of people who separate their career from their from their life. Um, you know, I I had a situation where RCA called. For instance, we got a call that. Um, I think it was the Florida, which was another Trident submarine, had some serious problems. Um, and they told us that um, we needed to meet an ocean-going tug the next morning at 0600 and go out there and fix the problem. Um, well, my children were waiting for me. And I had to tell them, I'm sorry, I have to... This is really, really important, and I have to do it, okay? 9-11. Um, uh, we were right smack dab in the middle of responding to that. And uh, we had some really seriously important stuff to do. 
Well, I missed most of my um, son's birthday party at five years old um, because we had to get this stuff done. So you made serious sacrifices, okay, and ones that wives sometimes didn't, un didn't understand. Sometimes they'd ask, where are you going? And all you could say was down south. Um, and that did not bode well for that. But uh, the totality in the life um, wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. So maybe you can sum up with? Um, I think you've pretty much hit on it all. The, uh, the people, the, talk about co-workers. Um, I mentioned we had a lot of respect for each other. Mm -hmm. But oh my goodness, we played such incredible tri tricks on people. And, um, you know, it was just one thing after another. Um, uh, and it didn't matter, you know, whether you were a supervisor or co you know, that thing just all blurred. Um, we were all just working together with one purpose. Um, and, um, you know, those people... Even today, I have such incredible respect for them. Um, they do such incredible work. Um, in all the time that I was in management, um, I terminated one person for cause because I gave him an assignment, and he said, no, I don't think that's an assignment I'm going to take. And I said, well, that's fine, then you're without a job. And I had to lay one person off. Um, but that just shows you the, um, the caliber of the people that were working with us. And, uh, you know, we didn't think of ourselves as managers versus, um, subordinates. You know, we were just all together. And if I, uh, if I would go down into what we called the tank and tell somebody I needed something, um, sometimes I got yelled at, okay? And um, one of my favorite expressions that they still joke about today was, stop telling me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. And then they would stop and they'd say, well, what you're asking for is ridiculous. But if you want to do this and this and this, we can do the same thing. Oh, okay, we'll do that. So, you know, that kind of thing with uh, co-workers, supervisors, it all just blurs together into a team. That's about all I can say about it. <laughs>